introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Zoe Lancelot. Um, hey, there she is. Uh, so at this point, if you want to if, go ahead and mute yourselves uh, and get settled in, uh, I'm going to turn the stage over to Dr. Lancelot in just a moment. But first, I want you to know that she earned her bachelor's degree from St. Mary's University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Then she earned her veterinary degree from the Atlantic Veterinary College on Prince Edward Island. She then completed her internship at the Veterinary Emergency Clinic and Referral Center in Toronto, and a second at VCA Veterinary Referral Emergency Center in Norwalk, Connecticut. Her residency was completed at Red Bank Veterinary Hospital uh, right here in New Jersey in Tenton Falls. And uh, she joined the surgery team at Oakland Veterinary Referral Service in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Uh, today, she's a board certified surgeon on the team at North Star Vets, and she's doing some amazing things. Uh, she has special interests in orthopedic surgery, wound management, surgical oncology, and minimally invasive surgery. So that is her background, uh, but she's also a lovely human being, and she's great with clients and uh, pets, and so uh, she has a great lecture for you guys tonight. So without any further ado, Dr. Lancelot, welcome. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to share my screen here with you guys. Okay, so I'm going to first um, go over everything here. Um, the first thing is, is that this is gonna be just basic bandage um, 101. Um, it is basic care um, of wounds um, and then uh, management of simple fractures, um, fractures that in the referral community um, that you guys can manage um, if you feel comfortable. And I just felt that going through some of these options um, would potentially give you some more information and feel more comfortable with managing them. So. All right, so the first thing we're going to go over um, is classification of wounds, um, the goals uh, for wound management. We'll then go over the uses and composition of bandages. Uh, we'll go over basic application, which I'm sure all of you know, but just some tips that potentially I can help you with. Um, some specific applications of bandages. Um, and then, of course, we all know that there can be complications um, with bandaging, whether that's soft tissue or with any of our fractures. And then just briefly going over client education, and what they should be aware of um, while we're doing bandaging. Um, so the first is classification of wounds. Now this is kind of academic, um, but it can help us in um, classifying and knowing when we should do what to wounds. Um, so class one um, are clean wounds with minimal contamination, um, you know, dura duration of zero to six hours. Class two would be wounds with significant contamination or six to 12 hour duration. And then class three is wounds uh, with gross contamination and uh, greater than 12 hour duration. Now, obviously the duration um, can have some overlap. Um, so we tend to go on how the contamination is. And so for class ones, um, these wounds once cleaned, flushed um, and debrided, you know, maybe these are the ones that we can close primarily um, without having to use a drain. Um, class two, once we have flushed, debrided, maybe we close those over a drain. Um, and then class three wounds with the gross contamination and the older wounds, um, perhaps we're going to need some open wound management um, for a few days prior to potentially closing those. Um, so uh, the goal to open wound management obviously is to facilitate healing without the development of an infection. We know that um, an infection um, is classified as um, 10 to the five colony forming units per gram of tissue. Um, and this can occur in as little as six hours. So what is the immediate management? Um, the first thing obviously we wanna do is assess the patient, make sure that they are stable. Um, and then our goal is to reduce the microbial burden and prevent further contamination. So the first thing that we wanna do is obviously clip the wound. Um, it's important that when we have an open wound that we are placing sterile lube in that area prior to shaving to reduce further contamination from the hair. Um, then we're going to want to flush or irrigate that wound um, to physically remove any gross contamination. 
Ideally, we want this between seven to eight PSI of pressure because um, this is, will effectively clean the wound without creating any sort of tissue damage. And we all know the saying, dilution is the solution to pollution. And so this is obviously our friend when we come to wounds. Um, we want to start antibiotics um, as soon as possible um, to help prevent the development of infection. And then, of course, debridement <clears throat> is very important as well. This will debride any foreign material, debris, um, any of the contamination, um, devitalized um, or necrotic tissue. Um, and this is obviously performed in an aseptic manner. We want to debride the tissue until we see bleeding. And then we want to protect, and obviously protection is in the form of a bandage. Um, so the first um, paper that I wanted to kind of go over is evaluating fluid pressures um, when flushing these wounds. Um, and so we all um, probably have used all three of these techniques. Um, the first being a saline bottle, puncturing some holes um, in the lid, um, and then kind of squeezing that bottle over the wound. Now this is only going to provide about four PSI. Um, so we're kind of below that level of that ideal seven to eight. Um, when we use a 35 mil syringe and we connect either a 16 gauge needle or an 18 gauge needle, we are well over um, and too high of a pressure from a pressure standpoint um, for these wounds. And so this type of flushing can lead to tissue damage. And so the ideal um, I guess flushing technique would be using a liter saline bag and putting in a pressurized cuff um, and then pressurizing that to about 300 millimeters of mercury because this has been shown to um, provide that 7.3 PSI, which is right in our ideal range. The next paper um, for wounds that I wanted to discuss is um, pretreatment of aerobic cultures um, to predict infections. Um, we all are asked, okay, well, we have a, a wound that comes in, it's an acute wound. Do we culture that initial wound to guide um, our selection of antibiotics to know is there gonna be an infection that will form? Um, so they looked at the initial swabs that were taken prior to and after lavage and debridement. And then they took swabs um, 14 days after presentation on wounds that had signs of infection. And basically what they saw is that the pretreatment um, wound cultures were not predictive of the bacterial species that were subsequently recovered on those infected wounds. And so in practice, I don't typically um, culture acute wounds. Um, I'll put them on antibiotics, send them home with antibiotics, um, and then if they do subsequently get an infection, then I'll culture that at that point and change my antibiotics based on those sensitivity results. The next um, is, okay, what if we have chronic or infected wounds? What is the best method in order to um, get an appropriate culture? Um, and so this paper um, looked at three different sampling techniques. <clears throat> they did the swab um, prior to the lavage and debridement, and then they did the swab after lavage and debridement, and then they also took a tissue biopsy. And although there were some differences in bacteria isolated from the biopsy, it was not significant or clinically significant. <clears throat> um, and so obviously the easiest um, form would be to do a culture swab. And they saw that wound debridement did not alter the number or type of bacteria isolated. And it didn't really change um, what we decide to, to select for our antibiotics. And so, you know, this is basically saying that the culture of chronic wounds um, can be done either before or after, and you're gonna have um, a good representation of that infected sample. So um, bandages, as we know, have multiple um, forms and multiple um, um, ways that uh, we use them. Um, so the first would be promote healing. Um, we can use them to protect areas. We can use them to immobilize and stabilize um, an area. Um, obviously, we want to use them for absorption um, if there's any exudate from these wounds. Um, apply and relieve pressure. Administer topical medications. And then also to eliminate dead space. So for composition, 
we all know the composition of bandages. We have primary layers, secondary layers, and then tertiary layers. Um, and we'll go into um, some of these moving forward. Um, but prior to, um, you know, understanding wounds, we need to kind of understand healing. Um, I'm not going to go into too much depth here on this, um, but we know that we have inflammation, we have proliferation, and we have remodeling. And so we're going to use different primary layers or primary, um, you know, techniques for four, depending on um, whether we're in one of these stages. And so the first, the inflammatory phase, um, this is, occurs immediately after injury, um, and it's mainly directed um, at minimizing any sort of blood loss, um, and um, it, it provides hemostasis through vasoconstriction, platelet aggregation, and clot formation, um, and then it's followed by vasodilation and phagocytosis. Um, phase two is the proliferation phase. Um, in this phase, you know, granulation, contraction, and epithelialization is occurring. And then phase three is the remodeling, um, where it involves the formation of some new collagen, wound tissue strengthening, and scar formation. And so for a primary layer, you know, the function um, acts as a barrier. Um, we're using it to absorb or transfer any exudate that is coming from the wounds. Um, and then it main maintains an appropriate environment for healing. And so we're looking at the absorptive ability, um, and obviously we want it to be sterile. And so when we look at the primary um, layer, we know that there can be adherent or non-adherent. Um, adherent dressings are obviously the dry to dry, wet to dry, and wet to wet. Um, these bandages have kind of fallen out of favor. Um, and the reason being is that they do help with debridement, but they aren't selective at what they're debriding. And so when you have a wet to dry bandage, um, you remove that bandaging material at the second bandage change, um, you can actually remove healthy tissue. And so these have kind of fallen out of favor and are more favorable um, primary layers are the non-adherent um, ones so that we are looking at kind of occlusive and semi-occlusive. So primary layers, these are some um, options that we have, and I'll just go into them briefly. Obviously, there's many more primary layers that we have, um, but these are some of the more common um, that we'll have or you will have in your facility or maybe that you will now think about um, purchasing for your facility. Um, so the first is Medi Honey. Um, this is a very easy primary layer. You know, you just put some either directly into the wound or onto um, a telpha pad um, and then apply it to the wound. Um, and it's inhibitory to microbial growth. Um, it has a very high sugar content. Um, it has low pH. And the production of hydrogen peroxide um, occurs um, when it reacts with the tissue. And so it contains the methyl glyoxal um, that reacts with the DNA, RNA, and proteins. And it can actually lead to the altered shape and size of the bacterial cells and can decrease their pathogenic potential. And so this is going to be placed on um, your initial wounds, kind of in that inflammatory phase um, of the wound healing that we went over earlier. Um, the second, which is obviously available to everyone, um, is sugar packets. Um, so why is sugar um, a good primary um, layer um, in these wounds that are acute? Um, and the reason being is that it has an hyperosmotic hyper effect. So it draws fluid out of the wound, um, creating an unfavorable environment um, for the bacteria within the um, and it may provide nutrients for the wound itself for its healing. Um, although it is sugar, and we know that honey obviously contains that high sugar content, it does not have the same properties as the Medi honey. And so we do not feel that it has an antimicrobial effect like the Medi honey does. The next primary layer would be calcium alginate. Um, these dressings um, come in um, you know, four by four squares. Um, they come in different sizes depending on what you purchase. Um, but these can be used for highly exudative wounds. Um, so if you're noticing that um, you put a, a, a bandage on and then, you know, you're having to change it daily, um, these can be um, used to help absorb that exudate. 
Um, and the, the first um, part of this is that it turns the exudate into a gel-like substance. So it creates a natural barrier to that bacteria. Um, and although it takes out that fluid, um, it keeps the, the wound surface, sorry, moist, um, enhances the otolytic primant and promotes granulation tissue formation. So um, these are great for highly exudative wounds. The next would be um, silver. Um, so these are used in contaminated wounds, again, in that kind of acute phase. Um, and it contains broad spectrum antimicrobial agents. So it covers against your gram positive and negative um, strains. Um, it binds to the negative components in the proteins, which eventually leads to the denaturation um, and modification of the cell walls. And then um, the, the nice thing about um, these strips um, or squares of the silver, um, such as the picture shows, is that if you put too much on a wound, um, it can actually be cytotoxic and delay epithelialization. So these have been formulated specifically for the use on wounds. Um, and again, they are used on highly exudative wounds um, due to their high um, absorp absorptive capacity. And then the ones that we probably all have and all have seen um, in our clinic um, are the adaptics, the triple antibiotic ointment and the telfas. Um, so the adaptics are just impregnated um, with petroleum emulsion. They allow the exudate to pass through the mesh um, without macerating the tissue. Um, it prevents adherence of the dressing to the wound bed um, or the second la secondary layer to that wound. And um, you know, these are obviously used once granulation tissue has uh, presented itself, um, where you still need protection, um, but you don't need that absorptive ability. Um, triple antibiotic can be placed on the telfa and then placed on the wound. Um, <clears throat> and this is just um, uh, for some added um, local antibacterial um, component to that wound management. And then telfas um, are non-adherent semi-occlusive dressings. Um, again, these are kind of used as the healing process um, progresses. So the secondary layer, um, as we know, functions for absorption, protection, and immobilization. Um, you know, we know these layers, um, one, the cotton can be placed, can't be placed too tight, whereas the um, gauze um, can, and we'll kind of go into that a little bit more um, as we go on. Um, so talking about some of the secondary layers, um, so the quick splints, um, these are good for um, some animals. Obviously, as you know, not all animals are formed the same. Um, and so these splints do not fit on every single animal. They're very specific. Um, and so, you know, if, you're, if you have these in your clinic and something fits great, um, that's wonderful. Um, but if they don't fit great, then there are definitely other alternatives that I'll talk to you about um, moving forward. Um, but say there is a a, a bad fracture that you just need to stabilize in order to transfer, sure, you can put this on um, as that secondary layer um, over your bandage just for stabilization temporarily before um, a more permanent situation has occurred. Um, we then have the metasplints and the spoon splints. Uh, metasplints, uh, you know, are used for the metacarpal and, uh, uh, fractures. Um, as are the spoon splints. Um, the thing with the spoon splints, uh, again, are the fit. And it's very important that you notice um, and are aware of how these are fitting on the dog. Um, if the paw pad does not fit in the spoon portion um, perfectly to then where the narrowing occurs at the carpus, um, what happens is the narrowing actually digs into the side of the paw, creating more issues. Um, so again, these are things that obviously you're going to want to monitor um, if you are using them very closely um, at, during the bandage changes to make sure that those pressure sores are not occurring. When we think of um, our toy breed dogs, um, what are some options that we have? Um, obviously, again, tongue depressors are there for use if you need to, um, but they're not our best option. And so um, something that 
we use frequently um, is aquaplast, um, which is in the right corner there. Um, and so these come in squares and they're actually um, thermoplastic. Um, so they mold once they're heated. So placing them in hot water, um, they come moldable and you can place them around. Um, and the reason that they're good in our toy breed dogs is that they're very light um, and they're easily easy to mold. And you can put multiple layers together to make it firmer um, and more stiff. And then as the progression of the fracture um, or whatever it is that you're treating with it, most likely a fracture, um, as that fracture is progressing and you want the animal to bear more weight on that limb, you can actually separate the layers and so you can destabilize them very easily. Um, so they're a very good option for um, your toy breed um, dogs. And then finally, obviously the vet cast tape. Um, we use this extremely frequently, um, probably the most common um, bandage that we use. Um, and, you know, it again, um, you can pre-mold it to the limb, um, cut it, um, and then run it under water, um, or you can put the whole roll under water. I tend to pre-mold it first, um, get the length that I need, and then put it under the water, um, knowing that I don't have a lot of time um, to get that bandage situated um, before it firms up. Um, and if you put it in hot water, um, it's going to become firm more quickly. Um, and so um, it will also produce a more um, uh, thermogenic reaction. Uh, so you want to be aware of that as well. Um, but it is, uh, can be used in any technique in any layer. Um, so when do you splint and cast? Um, so we want to splint or we want to cast um, if there's an open wound near a joint, um, because if that wound is under constant motion, that granulation tissue is not going to form. So mm -hmm. wounds that are on the paws, things like that, um, before we get that epithelialization occurring and that granulation tissue occurring, we may want to place um, a small splint on there to prevent that uh, motion. Um, we use them only if we can immobilize the joint above and below. Um, so again, this is, you know, really below the elbow um, and stifle. If it's non-articular, if you have an articular fracture, obviously surgery is the gold standard for that. If they're minimally displaced or incomplete, such as, you know, a green stick fracture, um, and the ability to reduce. And so there's a 50-50 rule. If we can get 50% of that fracture um, in contact, it ideally should heal. Um, we obviously wanna get it as reduced as we possibly can, but as long as we can get it at least to that 50-75% um, reduced, um, then a callus um, should be able to form. Um, and then we want if they're transverse, um, because obviously bandages are not going to be able to um, resist any sort of shearing motion. And so if we have any oblique uh, fractures, um, we can get, we can still get the shearing force. Um, and then obviously if it's a temporary or ancillary, just to provide support um, before um, transfer. So the tertiary layer, obviously this is functioning um, to hold and protect the underlying layers um, and it establishes um, the pressure, sub-bandage pressure. Um, materials that we use um, are elastic and elastic, cohesive versus adhesive and porous or waterproof. Um, and so obviously the vet wrap, um, elasticon um, and the easy fix are kind of the most common that are used. So basic application of a bandage. Now, most of you obviously know how to do this, um, but perhaps there's something that I can say um, tonight that um, may provide some more information for you. And um, so the number one uh, or the first step is obviously to place the stirrups. Um, these are very important um, used so that the bandage does not slip between or below the toes. Um, and so, you know, you can use a tab um, on the, the, the tape um, or you can use a tongue depressor in between so that once the bandage is on and you want to then um, reverse the adhesive side of that tape onto the bandage, um, you can separate them easily. 
Um, the next um, is um, the, the cast padding itself. Um, and as we know, this cannot be placed too tight, this layer. So if you pull it too tight, it's just gonna tear. Um, so you wanna pull it firmly, just not too tight. Um, and you wanna make sure that you have 50% overlap on each layer. Um, one of the things that I found, because it's super annoying when you have those dogs that have extremely large thighs, um, and then they have these really skinny feet um, or paws. And so um, what I like to do is I actually like to build up um, the bottom portion, um, kind of up to that tarsal or even the stifle, depending some of these um, bulldogs that have the really thick thighs. Um, I like to build up the bottom of the bandage before going over the knee so that I kind of have almost um, a cylindrical leg um, instead of having this really big thigh and this really tiny paw. Um, and the reason that I do that is because I find that it helps um, prevent slipping down um, on the thigh um, and provides a little bit more stability um, to that layer. The next um, is the cling or the or the gauze. Um, now this layer obviously can be put on too tight. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you are pulling firmly, um, just not overly tight. And so you wanna see compression of that cast padding underneath this layer, but you don't wanna see kind of rings around or placed within the gauze. Um, if you do that, um, that will create pressure points um, and a tourniquet effect that can be detrimental. Um, at this point, if it was just a wound that was on this leg and you didn't need any splinting, um, then you would um, pull your, your stirrups back um, and finish your bandage. Um, if you are putting in your splint, obviously this is when it would go on at this point. Um, and, you know, when using this vet, um, cast material, um, you know, we usually suggest at least uh, five, six layers um, to provide the stability that you need. Now, obviously, if it's a larger dog or a smaller dog, you may adjust that, um, but kind of the routine um, is at least um, six layers um, and then cutting it. And what I like to do is I also like to trim the edges um, of the bandage um, or of the cast, sorry, um, so that we don't have sharp edges um, in the four quadrants of um, the cast. Um, if you do have the cast, um, I would say that the stirrups should go up over top of um, the cast itself. Um, in this depiction as well. Um, after this point, I would then put more gauze over top. Um, because this cast padding or um, vet cast, sorry, um, can indent. Again, you want to make sure that you're just basically putting that gauze over as a little bit of a holding layer to keep the formation while it hardens. Um, you want to make sure that you're not pressing in too hard because you can get uh, fingerprints and things like that in there that again, any of those um, ruffles are going to create pressure points. And then finally, obviously, um, putting your um, that wrap over type over top. This can be too tight again um, with this layer. And so you wanna make sure that you are pulling it off the kind of roll um, prior to putting it around the limb um, so that you have control of how firmly you are placing this. And again, each layer should be 50% overlap and you wanna make sure that you cannot see the cast padding um, underneath. Um, so now let's go into more specific bandages um, if you need in difficult areas. Um, the first is an example is a wound on the hip. Now this is obviously a chronic wound, so you're going to want to clip clean to bride and do all of that, and you're not going to be able to close it at this point. Um, so for the tie overs, um, you want to use um, uh, Suture, sorry, um, I typically um, will use a nylon, um, but PDS would be fine as well. And you wanna place these anchor sutures about one and a half to three centimeters from the wound edge. Um, I probably would put a little less than what is shown in this image, uh, but you wanna make sure that you have the ability to cover the entire um, wound with your bandage. And so, you know, you put your primary layer, whatever it may be, telfas, whatever it is, and then you're going to cover it um, with lap sponges or gauze. Um, you can either just 
do the umbilical tape over top of the gauze. I prefer to use the, um, the lap sponge uh, paper that it comes in to cover the bandage just as another protective layer um, over top that gauze. Um, but these are really good for any wounds that are in locations where a bandage just really isn't going to cover it or um, you know that you're gonna get a lot of slipping from that bandage due to the height um, or the awkward nature of that wound. So for thoracic wraps, um, these again um, can be a little frustrating with the sliding down either um, from the torso or around the limbs. Um, and so one technique is to use um, the elasticon um, kind of as a base layer. This obviously can be placed way too tight. So what I recommend is taking it off of the roll um, and then placing it around just along the circumference. You don't have to have any tension on this one. Um, and basically then you're gonna place your um, cross the heart um, bandage. Um, and then once you get your vet wrap down to your kind of base layer, you then put another elasticon over top um, and that will <clears throat> hold, theoretically hold um, the bandage in place from slipping. For the shoulders, um, you know, I call this a bra strap, but you know, it can be called whatever you'd like. Um, and it, again, it's just using the elasticon over the front of the bandage. And what that does is it holds those straps in place um, so that they aren't sliding down the shoulders. Then for emer slings and hobbles. Um, so emer slings and hobbles are obviously used for um, hip luxation. So if you guys are reducing um, hips at your clinic um, and then wanting to use um, the bandages in order to um, help facilitate the healing, um, these are what you'll use. Um, the craniodorsal, we'll use the emer. Um, the caudoventral, we use the hobbles. Um, hobbles, obviously you can use tape um, you don't need specific bandages. Um, with the emers, you can do the same thing. I find the tape very difficult um, to keep on. Um, and I find that if you are able to keep it on, you end up getting it too tight um, and creating some swelling. And so um, there are vests um, available from different companies. This just happens to be um, one company, but you um, can use these um, in your clinic. You can purchase them if you need to um, have the owners place deposit. Um, and that way, if they don't return for their checkup, which hopefully they would, um, and they take that bandage with you, uh, with them, you can then charge them that length. <coughs> Um, so when we talk about Emer slings, this paper um, came out um, in 2019, and it was kind of analyzing, do we actually need to bandage these dogs after we reduce their hips in the craniodorsal or the Emer sling? And what they found is that 43.5% had relaxation at or near the time of sling removal. Sorry, I should say relaxation, um, not relaxation. Um, and that um, relaxation was five times more likely when no, with known trauma compared to when trauma was not witnessed. Um, and then 50% had soft tissue injury. Um, 17 of those 46 were severe and one actually required limb amputation due to the complications. Um, and the number one reason for these soft tissue injuries was poor owner compliance. Um, and so, you know, that proves that we need to be very, um, we need to let owners know about all complications that can occur and make sure that they are very well aware um, of what to look out for and what to watch for and when it is important for them to come back in. And so overall, this study saw that there was a low success rate um, with the hip luxations and a high complication. And so they suggest, you know, maybe we, if we are doing closed reductions, that we then just restrict their activity significantly instead of placing this bandage um, to see if we can get the same sort of outcome. Obviously, further studies have to be done um, on that um, before we know for sure. So then finally, I just wanted to go over some fractures um, that you may see in your clinic that um, can be 
managed by you primarily, um, if you feel comfortable um, and not necessarily have to refer. Obviously, we're always here for you if you do feel that um, you require our services. But um, this is a, an injury, <clears throat> obviously a tibial fracture um, in a very young dog. Um, and as you can see that the fibula is intact here. And so that fibula is acting as an internal splint for this fracture. And so although it is, um, has some obliquity to it, um, and we know that the bandages won't resist that shearing, that fibula being intact is actually prohibiting the shearing forces. <clears throat> and so a bandage can be placed um, on this. Obviously you wanna go up over the stifle or the knee joints so that you're mobilizing the joint above and below the fracture. Um, and usually for these young animals, you know, the, the splint probably only has to be on for about three to four weeks. We want to obviously take an x-ray um, at that time frame to make sure that it is completely healed prior to removing it. And then we want to make sure that the animals are restricted or slowly being returned to activity once we have um, observed complete healing radiographically. The next one um, is uh, uh, digit fractures. Um, so, you know, this is a weight bearing digit. Um, and so these dogs can be quite painful um, during the initial injury. And so splinting them um, and allowing them to heal, um, you know, just using a small, even if it's just a meta splint or using the vet cast um, in order to provide some stability for them. So they're more walking on that cast than they are walking on their digit um, to allow healing. Now, this is a good example of why orthogonal views are very important to take, um, because even if we do notice swelling of that toe, on the image on the left, um, the AP view, you know, it's, it's difficult to see um, if there's a fracture there, but we can clearly see it on the lateral view. And again, this goes for if we have um, metacarpal fractures um, that are kind of mid-diaphyseal there, um, the same technique can be used. We can splint those as well. The only time that we would really think about fixing um, metatarsals is usually in working dogs. Um, and obviously, if they're articular um, or, or more proximal, you may want to refer so that we can evaluate that. Um, but these types of fractures can definitely be handled um, at your clinic. Um, and then this um, is very classic, a toy breed dog um, that has a radial fracture and the ulna in this image appears to be intact. Um, and so there, there is a very minimal displacement. Um, we could probably reduce this fairly well closed um, and splint it. Now, the issue with toy breed dogs <clears throat> um, is that about 83% of these distal radial ulnar fractures addressed with external coaptation um, alone will often result in malalignment or non-union. And it's just because of the decreased blood supply and the decreased amount of soft tissues in that area, we tend to see more complications in these um, toy breed dogs. Now, if this was um, a larger dog, um, you know, we don't tend to see as many complications with those just because they do um, have kind of a larger soft tissue component. So they have better sub blood supply to the fracture. Um, so if you are splinting these, it's just very important that taking x-rays um, at um, intervals to make sure that we're not seeing any sort of complications. And so finally, talking um, about complications that we can see with these bandages. So the first would just be skin irritation or mild dermatitis. Um, this is commonly seen um, after bandages are on for a fairly long period of time. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times these occur, at least um, a lot of the dermatitis or skin irritation occurs from the stirrups that are constantly being taken off and replaced um, at the time of bandage change. And so we can leave the actual stirrup on, just cut the tape at the toes, um, and then place the tape on top of that layer so that we're only removing the stirrup um, at the time of removing the bandage. Um, that'll help prevent um, some of the skin irritation. But if you do see these superficial skin irritation, you know, it is important that we protect these areas. And so whether you're putting on um, a little layer of say it's triple antibiotic ointment um, with a telfa over top of these, um, in this case, it was kind of pretty much the whole limb 
area of the limb. So what I did in this case is I just wrapped it um, with the adaptix, um, put the telfas on, and then did the bandage just to help keep the environment um, appropriate to allow these to heal. Pressure sores. So these are very common, like I said, especially with those spoon splints um, at the areas of the carpus um, or the carpal pads. Um, they can get very irritated. Um, obviously, pressure points or occurs. Pressure sores occur at prominences. And so this one is the olecranon and the elbow. And so what I would do here is obviously clean this up, shave it up, um, put some padding, extra padding on there. And I may even put a donut, uh, make a donut, whether that's with the gauze um, or some tape and um, put that um, in between the layers um, to provide some more protection um, on those regions. And then failure. So like I discussed with um, toy breed dogs, we tend to have a higher rate of failure. Um, and so this is a, a young dog um, that presented for a fracture, as you can see, minimally displaced, the ulna's intact. All right, this seems ideal to be splinted. Um, and so splinting um, was preceded. Um, and then on follow-up x-rays, um, we had this occur. And so this is obviously um, a malalignment here um, and potentially a non-union. Now, clinically, this dog was doing great, was walking on the limb, wasn't painful, and this fracture was stable. And so ultimately, um, we're still waiting for this dog to come back to see how um, eventually it progresses. Um, but our hope is that um, this will potentially continue to heal um, and will will heal in this location. Um, but we are, won't get rid of the angulation, but as long as the dog um, is pain-free um, and everything remains stable, um, then this dog may not need surgery um, at this time. Um, if there is no healing or no significant healing um, in this area at our recheck, then surgical um, correction um, and stabilization will be the recommendation. And then vascular compromise, probably the most critical um, issue that we have um, that can occur with bandages and why owner compliance and education is so important. Um, and so this was a case that came to us um, that had a bandage on and had strangulation um, of the paw. Um, and so we, this is obviously after we debrided the area um, that had the most noticeable um, injury to the tissue um, and devitalized tissue. Um, as you can tell, the digits are quite dark, um, but we didn't want to divide that originally to give it the benefit of the doubt to see would it um, heal appropriately um, and survive. Ultimately, it did not. Um, so then the tissue um, that was um, dead had to de be debrided. And so you can see kind of the phalanges there. Um, it, the bone is a, a bit exposed um, in those areas. And so we allowed um, to see if the tissue would granulate over. Ultimately, um, it did not. But we were able to save that metatarsal pad, which is so important um, for weight bearing um, if we don't have any digits available to us. Um, and we knew that if we could save that, this dog um, would hopefully be able to get around comfortably. Um, so we ultimately did have to take the digits um, to allow the granulation tissue to heal. Um, but as you can see, that metatarsal pad um, did survive, which was fantastic. And so this was at the last recheck and you can see the epithelialization um, of the paw um, occurred quite nicely. And so, you know, we were able to save the limb in this case, um, but some of these aren't so lucky and amputations ended up required. And so that's why it's so important that we discuss these complications with owners so that they are aware um, that, you know, bandages aren't benign. Um, it may seem like the easy um, option, um, but sometimes they can create more problems than they can good. 
And so um, with our client education, um, you know, we really want to send them home with a bandage care handout. Um, and so we send, we have one formulated and with every bandage, we send them home with it. And so that's something that if you don't already utilize, um, it is something that you um, should kind of formulate. Um, and if you need help with that, you can definitely reach out. Um, and so we want owners to know when to recheck. Um, obviously, we want them to recheck if the bandage becomes soiled or wet. Um, and this doesn't always happen. Um, and then we're dealing, obviously, with the consequences of that. Uh, but when a bandage gets soiled or wet, um, it not only creates um, an environment that allows the bacteria outside that we're trying to protect these wounds from um, to get underneath or through that bandage, but also when it dries after it's become wet, it can constrict um, creating that tourniquet effect leading to um, that vascular compromise. Um, if they see slipping, um, so, uh, you know, monitoring the top and the bottom of the bandage, if they're noticing that that bandage has slipped, especially if there is a splint involved, it's very important that they come in because if that splint falls or slips beyond um, the proximal joint, it's going to then act as a fulcrum um, to that issue uh, or to that fracture, sorry, um, and cause again, more damage than it is um, good. So we want to make sure that we're educating them before they go home, um, letting them kind of going over the bandage and what it looks like at the time of discharge so that they are aware if there's any changes in those um, that it can come. And then swelling. I like to, if possible, if the wound is not on um, one of the digits, is to leave a couple of the digits exposed um, at the bottom. And so what that allows us to do um, is to have the owners continue to evaluate um, the toes. And so if they start seeing that those nails are starting to spread apart um, or the toes are starting to become cold or warm, um, they will know that they can come in. And then um, this is kind of the goes with the um, soiled or, or wet bandage, um, but the strike through. So if they're noticing that there's exudate coming through that bandage, they obviously need to be rechecked so that bandage can be changed. And then if we're noticing strike through, then we know that we need to address that primary layer to a more effective um, absorptive ability. Um, and then stop using the limb. So if they're using the limb very well, um, and then all of a sudden they stop, um, then, um, you know, that is obviously um, for concern um, and they should be reevaluated. A lot of times these animals that have splints on that are using the limb, it's not, and then stop using the limb. A lot of times, although it can be um, an issue with the fracture or the wound itself, um, a lot of times it's because they're getting wounds elsewhere on the limb. So it creates discomfort um, and swelling under there. And so that is why they end up not using the limb. Um, and then smell, um, you know, this is something that um, we obviously don't deal with too much, um, but usually we're smelling it when the bandage comes off completely. However, if an owner is noticing um, a smell to that bandage, we want them to come in because that can indicate um, um, infection that's underneath. Um, so, you know, it was a, a very basic um, lecture. Um, but hopefully I did provide some new information for you all and hopefully you can use that um, in clinics um, during your, your daily use. Um, but I will open it up to questions. So I think Phil will come back on and go over those. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lancelot. That was phenomenal. Uh, excellent, excellent uh, coverage of, of that topic. Um, so we've got a couple of minutes, guys. If you have some questions about this, you want to pick a surgeon's brain about bandaging or anything related, um, you can type it in the chat. Or uh, if no one else is talking, you can unmute and ask your question. All right. Welcome, Diana. So while well, if you're typing a question, keep typing. I'm just going to talk and, and buy a minute to, to formulate your questions. Uh, so if you like this topic, then you will like uh, our first topic next month. 
uh, Dr. Gregory Zunt is uh, one of our surgery residents here, and he's going to give a talk on uh, fracture repairs. But I think there's a lot of synergy with tonight's topic. So I think he's going to touch on some bandaging and he's going to touch on some wound management, uh, but with the primary focus on, on fracture repair. So uh, it'll be a fresh take on this topic. So if you really dug it and you want some more, uh, we'll give that to you on Thursday, December 2nd. That is coming right up. That's in like two weeks, I think. Yeah, like two weeks and one day. So um, that is happening soon. And then a uh, week after that is our final social networking's talk for the year. And Dr. Adam Miller of our internal medicine team is going to give an IMHA talk. And so uh, you can find those. I'm going to uh, make sure those links are available to you. Uh, I'll send, it, send you the direct uh, URLs tomorrow so you can sign up for those. And then we're already starting to plan our 2022 calendar. I'm super excited about it. We've baked some really cool things into it and uh, some, some really fun and, and fresh things. And um, so... Uh, I think you'll like it. That's going to come out soon. It's going to get the final details pinned down and we'll share it. And you can see what's happening in 2022 social networking. So we're going to continue to uh, go big and go strong next year. All right. So I did see some questions come in. We're rolling in. Okay. Um, so the first one is how often do you like to check or change bandages for splints weekly? Yes. Yeah, so, um, we do weekly bandage changes, um, for our splints, um, uh, in order to catch anything early, um, or any issues that we may have, especially if it's originally, um, the injury occurs or the fracture occurs, you're going to get some swelling. And so it is important, at least for that first week that you are, um, getting them back in, um, within that five to seven days, um, because as that swelling decreases with time, that bandage can become loose. Um, and so you definitely want to make sure that you're getting them in weekly. Um, if the dog is young, so say the dog is, or the cat, um, is really young and you're doing splint bandages, you may want to check those a little bit more frequently because they're they're going to be growing more significantly more quickly and so you want to make sure that your splint um, is the right length and the right size um, for that um, and so yes the long and short of it is usually we want to change those weekly um, if it's a bandage for a wound that's obviously going to be dependent on how much exudate is occurring um, from that wound um, so you may need to have to do those daily you may have to do those every other day um, and but eventually as the exudate um, decreases and the granulation tissue um, formulates then you'll be able to get those out weekly maybe even every two weeks you're going to be changing those after that um, the next one, so bandages in the inguinal region. So, um, with stay shoot, so this is obviously a very challenging area because not only is it in a challenging area to bandage, but it's also an area of motion. Um, and so yes, um, would a tie over bandage work in this area? It will. Um, you want to make sure, obviously, for the male dogs in the inguinal region, um, that you're not placing it too tight um, to maneuver the prep use or anything of that nature. Um, but yes, the, the the stay sutures will stay in that area. Um, the difficult or the the one of the things that I did not dive into um, is the vac or the wound vac. Um, that is a, a technique. Um, that we do here for certain areas, especially the inguinal area um, that is used, but that's obviously more advanced um, and not all of you may have the access to those, um, but for inguinal region, I definitely would use a tie over bandage. Next question um, is, what is your preferred antibiotic therapy for wounds? Um, so, yeah, so that's a good question. I guess um, what we'll usually use, depending on what it really looks like, and, and a lot of times also the size of the animal, and so what's most convenient um, for that animal if it's not something that I specifically know. Um, and so, you know, starting out, um, if it is obviously a grossly 
gross wound, um, I may start with clavamox, um, pending the culture. Um, if it's something that, you know, is one of those acute wounds that we can just flush to bride um, and close primarily, you know, maybe we're looking more at a cephalexin or a simplicef. Um, so it really does depend on what that wound looks like as to what guides um, my antibiotic choice initially. Um, but if we, you know, can use those kind of groups of drugs, um, and then once it, or hopefully there won't be an infection, but if an infection does occur, you know, getting that culture and using those sensitivity results will be um, our kind of gold standard. Uh -huh.